This is a going back, Remembering UGA interview with Southern author, columnist, and speaker, Daryl Huckabee. Today, September 26, 2013, we're in the conference room of the Ray Nicholson House on the University of Georgia campus. Others with us include Alice Vernon and videographer Bill Evelyn, members of the Going Back crew, and I'm Fran Lane. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, Fran. How are you today? I'm great, and we're just so glad that you have come and, and will visit with us today to, to reminisce. I'm happy to be here. Let's start at the beginning. I uh, haven't had the opportunity to read about your growing up years in your newspaper column. Many of us feel as if we know you, but I would like you to talk about a time and a town where people never locked the door or even owned a house key. Tell us a little bit about Porterdale. Porterdale is a mill village in Newton County. I always tell people I was raised in a four-room mill village house and we didn't even have a bathroom in our house until I was in the fifth grade. I got five now. Six count in the back porch. Over, overcompensated. That's right. But, uh, you know, when I was, was taking sociology as a freshman at Georgia, my sociology professor learned that I was raised in a mill village. And he announced to the whole class, Mr. Huckabee was raised in poverty in a North Georgia mill village. Now, my professor was obviously educated far beyond his intelligence because we weren't poor in Porterdale. We just didn't have any money. And that, that's, there's a big difference in those two things. We had the run of that village. We could be out the door as soon as it got daylight. We didn't have to be home till the street lights came on. I had a marvelous, marvelous childhood. You know, my kids have been everywhere and done everything, but I had a much better childhood than they did because I didn't have to be afraid of anything. Everywhere I was, there were 2,000 sets of eyes on me. If I did something I shouldn't have, my mama would know it before I got home, and she'd send me to cut a switch. So Porterdale was just a, a great, great place to be. We made our own fun. You know, I see people playing Little League Baseball today and they have coaches and uniforms and bat bags and silk jackets for six-year-olds. But we played, I got to bat a hundred times a day because we'd pick, we'd choose upsides and play our own games and we'd play football and baseball and basketball all year long and, and uh, we'd build forts and play down by the river and sneak and go swimming when we weren't supposed to in the river, even though we had a really nice swimming pool there in the city that we could all swim in for free, but uh, I had a marvelous childhood. Tell us a little bit about your, your family. My lovely wife, Lisa, and I have been married, we, well, we recently celebrated 31 happy years of marriage, and that's not bad out of 40. No, <laughs> no, we, I met Lisa at Valdosta State. I was coaching in South Georgia and taking a class to renew my teaching certificate, and she was taking the class as an undergraduate. And I had known her parents and coached against her father uh, when I first got out of school and started teaching and coaching. Uh, and we just met in the class that we were taking and uh, the rest, as they say, are history. We have three children. Dr. Jamie Huckabee uh, is a graduate of the University of Georgia Pharmacy School. Uh, Jackson Lee Huckabee, who was named after that Jackson and that Lee. I don't care who knows it, Jackson is 6'4" weighs 142 pounds, soaking wet. When he dresses in red, he looks like a thermometer on a hot August day. But Jackson's a, a teacher and a coach, uh, coaches girls basketball and teaches math at North Oconee High School. And then we have Jenna, um, who is a journalism major in the Henry Grady School of Journalism and will graduate in May 2014. And uh, She's the free spirit of the bunch. Uh, we never know where Jenna's gonna be or when she's gonna be or what she's gonna be doing, but uh, she's a great student and a better writer than I am by far. I told my kids they could go to Georgia or any college they could afford to pay for, and so they all opted for the University of Georgia. And I was real happy they could get in because you know, all my kids made 1,400 or more on the SAT during the, uh, under the old scoring system. Two of us used to get in for that, uh, but I was afraid they wouldn't get in because it's tough now. When, the, my, when my letter came, when I got my acceptance, it came addressed to Daryl Huckabee or a current occupant. Not that way anymore. <laughs> well, that's, and you finished in 74 slash 75, right? Yeah, I, got, I did my student teaching in 74, but in those days they didn't have a winter commencement, so I had to wait until the following spring 
to walk and my diploma says 1975 but I want it known that I graduated in 1974 four years after I graduated from high well, school you have got that now on tape that's right so it's recorded and I graduated again in 1997 with my masters Dale, let's go back to to Portadale you went to public school yeah oh yeah yeah we went we didn't have kindergarten in Porterdale, so I started in first grade, went first through eighth grade at Porterdale. And then uh, when I got to high school, had to go to town in Covington to Newton County Comprehensive High School. And that was quite, a, quite an adjustment because in, in Porterdale, we all had grown up together. Everybody lived in the same kind of little mill village house. Everybody's parents drove six or seven year old cars and, and uh, we just, we're used to one another, but when we went to Covington, it was a whole different world. And I remember I made friends, and they started inviting me home to their houses. And uh, I remember Jimmy Hutchins was one of my best friends in high school. We were roommates for three years at Georgia, and I never his his father was a pharmacist uh, and a successful business person in Covington. But when I went to Jimmy's house, it was the first time I'd ever been to a house that had carpet on the floor light switches on the walls. Our lights had a little chain that hung down. You'd turn them on and he had an actual shower, his own bathroom and a shower. Uh, I thought that was amazing, but it was kind of sad because after I got used to being in houses like that, I was kind of embarrassed to bring my new friends home to my house in Porterdale. Our house during elementary school had been the, the center um, of the universe. That's where everybody hung out. My mama was a great cook and she loved having kids around. And I know it really hurt her feelings that, that when I got to high school I didn't bring my friends around as much anymore. But you know we learn a lot of lessons after we think we know it all and, and uh, now I'm just very very proud of, of being from Porterdale because there were some great great people and every one of those people uh, took an interest in making sure that my life was successful. And it sounds like a good family too, strong family folks. If you went to Newton County High School when I was growing up, they had a heck of a men's basketball. That's right. Yeah. I was I was actually played JV basketball for Ronald Bradley in the ninth grade, and I was heavy into Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout, and there were a lot of conflicts with my scouting and basketball and. With Coach Bradley, basketball had to come first, and so I was the manager of the team for my last three years, and that way I could be absent if I needed to to do the scouting things that I needed to do. So I was a big part of that basketball program. We won 129 straight home games. I remember. And lost to Wills in December of my 10th grade year, uh, and then we won 40 more straight home games. So. Yeah, it was, uh, we played for the state championship three times uh, when I was in high school and lost in the championship game each time. I just remember that from, from years back. Where did you go to school? Athens High, high school. school. Oh, Ath Athens came down during our, they were number 122 in the win streak and they were actually ahead um, by about three points late in the game and it looked like they may break our streak and all of a sudden the dangest thing happened, the lights went out in the whole gym. Isn't that a And everything, everything just went surprise. dark. And uh, it took them a while to get the lights back on. And I guess they lost their composure. It may have scared them or something. I don't know, but we, we handled them after that. But We may have to turn the lights out at the stadium this weekend. I hope not. Whew. I hope not. Ta why the University of Georgia? Well, let first. Early influences, you've spoken of, of your home and, and the people in your community. Was there somebody or? Well, you know, my daddy was born in 1911 and he, he, he was raised in Winter, well he was, his daddy worked for the Georgia Railroad. He spent a lot of his childhood over in Wintersville. And of course that's close by and he used to tell me stories about coming to Athens. He and my uncle on the day that Georgia beat Yale in 1929, the first game ever played in Sanford Stadium, Catfish Smith scored every point. Mm -hmm. They rode a hand car from Winterville to Athens and set it off right on the, on the railroad trestle and watched the game. So I'd heard stories about Georgia all my life. Daddy and I used to come to football games over here. We couldn't afford tickets, 
but we would sit on the trestle, on the railroad tracks and watch the games. I mean, when I was a little bitty boy. And mama would make us a tailgate lunch. Our tailgate was a mayonnaise sandwich wrapped in wax paper. She'd fix me a, a fruit jar full of sweet iced tea. And uh, I guess daddy's fruit jar was water because it was clear, it didn't have any color to it. But we'd sit there and watch the games and I would think, man, if I could ever get inside that stadium, Fran Tarkington and, and those people. Um, I also had a cousin, uh, Carolyn Thompson at the time, later Carolyn Stone. And she was the first person in our extended family to go to college and she came to Georgia in, in the early 60s. Uh, she lived in Myers Hall and when she moved in, I helped her to move in. I thought I was really, really big. I was about nine years old and they were, we were moving in and she would always holler man on the hall when we'd bring a load of stuff up and uh, I just thought the University of Georgia was the grandest place I'd ever seen. There was never any doubt in my parents' mind that I was going to go to college, that I was going to have a better life than they did, and they knew that education was the road to that life. Uh, I wouldn't say a better life, but a uh, more financially successful life, I guess, to put it. So uh, I knew I was going to go to Georgia from the time I was really, really, really small. And uh, I would go over and visit Carolyn the whole time she was here. And, and I was, and then Coach Dooley came and uh, turned the football program around, and we got to be even bigger and bigger fans. And so there was never really a question of, of where I was going to go to school or that I was going to go to school. This, this was the place. Amen. Talk a little bit, you talked about coming to Georgia as a young, young fella. Darrell, talk about what was your first impression of campus when you arrived on campus to go to school? You know, I was probably, without a doubt, the greenest, now that doesn't even make sense, probably without a doubt, but I had to be one of the greenest people who had ever been on campus at the University of Georgia. I didn't know anything about the world. I'd rarely been outside of uh, Newton County or Porterdale, uh, and the way I would describe the campus was just big. It was just so big, but I came on a scholarship as a basketball manager and I moved into McWhorter Hall and you know I think about when I bring my kids over here when I brought all three of my kids for the first day and, and then when they moved back in and we brought so much stuff you had to have a futon and you had to have a computer and you had to have this and you had to have that I still remember the Sunday that mom and daddy brought me over here and I had a, about five or six shirts and pants on a hanger and I had a little suitcase full of t-shirts and, and underwear and socks and so forth. And I had a Smith Corona portable typewriter and an eight track tape player. That was it. It took one trip up the steps of McWhorter Hall, put it down in the room and no we were done. No, it needed. No, no, nothing done. We were, we were, we were done. And uh, they said goodbye. And, you know, back in those days, Ken Roseman was the basketball coach and he, Coach Roseman didn't believe anybody in Georgia could play basketball. The only Southerner on the team, the only two Southerners on the team were Lanny Taylor from South Carolina and Cawthon Westbrook from up the road in Isla and, and me. And I had never been around a Yankee American before. It was just all culture shock to me. I mean, we had Gino John Francesco from Pittsburgh and we had still Steven Zuko from from Pittsburgh, Barry Cohen from New York, I never will forget. This was back in the day, you'll have to understand. Um, I had a, a, a postcard of George Wallace on my bulletin board. And Barry Cohen came in one day, he was my sweet mate. And uh, Barry came in and looked at that. He said, Huck, what have you got on your bulletin board? I said, well, that's Governor Wallace from Alabama. He said, Huck, you got to take this down. I said, why? He said, he's anti-Semite. I said, what is that? He said, he doesn't like Jews. I said, well, I don't guess I do either. I had no, I'd never met a Jew. But he said, I'm a Jew. I said, oh, well then, you can take it down then. So, so but I was just, uh, you know, the classes, and it was so hot. My friends and I would walk around campus 
we weren't smart enough to figure out how to use the bus for about the first six six weeks of, of school and uh, I was lost I was like a babe in the woods and you know I didn't handle being on my own very well because studying was the last thing on my mind I was a good student um, I'm one of the smartest people I know but I just couldn't handle all the freedom. I, there was too much to do and too many places to go and too many people to visit with. And uh, that first semester was tough for me because I didn't do a lot of studying. I had trouble for the first time in my life with grades. Um, so it was, it was quite a culture shock. In fact, I remember I was homesick too. I was very, very homesick because Coach Roseman wouldn't let anybody go home until Thanksgiving. Uh, and it turned out to be Christmas, but I was only 60 miles down the road to my home, but I didn't have a car, and uh, I, I just missed my mama so bad, and I called, I'd call over and over, she'd quit answering the phone, because in those days, you know, you ran up a big phone bill, it's not like today with, with free long distance and free text messages, she just quit answering the phone, because the phone bill was, was too high, so I had a hard time getting adjusted, and I remember I went home, at Christmas and it was the day after Christmas and we were supposed to leave the next day to go to Charlotte for a basketball tournament we didn't get home until December 22nd so I had only three days at home after that whole semester away from home I think we were quarters then actually but I told my daddy I don't think I'm gonna go back he said what do you mean I said I don't know I just don't I don't think I'm gonna go back to school I don't think college is for me he said, well, okay, suit yourself. So he picked up the phone and he called Mr. Snow, who was the superintendent of the mills in Porterdale. He said, Mr. Snow, Darrell doesn't think he wants to be on the basketball team and have a scholarship and get a free education anymore. So uh, you got a job for him in the mill? And okay, okay, thank you. So he told me, Mr. Snow said you could report at three o'clock tomorrow in the slasher room, which was one of the worst places in the mill. And, He'd give you a job on the second shift for $1.20 an hour. And uh, I said, you know, maybe being on the basketball team and traveling all over the southeast and uh, maybe college isn't so bad after all. So uh, I went back and things, got, wise, things got better and better and better. Father. Absolutely. Wise father. What was your academic major? Actually, I started in physical education. I was in journalism to begin with because I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a sports writer like uh, Furman Bisher or Jesse Outlaw. But then I decided I wanted to be my high school basketball coach, Ronald Bradley. I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to be him. So in those days, they still taught physical education in school, and each school had several physical education teachers, and kids took it often. And in those days, if you wanted to be a coach, you majored in physical education. So I was a PE major. I had um, Dr. Clements and the great Earl Fales and uh, Black Mike Castronis. Oh, they were some Bob wonder. Uh, he, you know, I never had him for a class. He had just retired, uh, but I knew him. He was around a lot, and uh, we had such great, great teachers in that physical education department because they really enjoyed what they were doing, and they liked the kids, and so. That was a great uh, department to be in, actually. You spent a lot of time in Stegman Hall? Oh, yeah, Stegman Hall was, uh, I'll never forget that place. I had Pete Sholey, I took swimming my first semester, and Coach Sholey, there was a big clock right next to the pool in um, Stegman, and it didn't have a face on it. So about the third or fourth day of class, somebody got the big idea, it might have been me, that we could just move that clock up 10 minutes. He would have us come in and sit in the bleachers right beside his office while he was in his office. And then he would come out and blow his whistle. All right, you guys, let's get ready to swim. He was a Yankee too. The place was full of them back then. And so I got the big idea that if we move that clock hand up 10 minutes every day while we're sitting there, we get through 10 minutes early and then uh, we could move it back after he went in. So we did that all semester, and we got by with, with a shorter class and less swimming all semester. Then the week before finals, Coach Sholey came in and said, all right, you guys have taken 10 minutes away from me three days a week for 10 weeks, so that's 30 minutes a day, that's 300 minutes. You have 300 minutes of swimming you owe me before the final on Friday, so you just come in and sign in and do it. 
So we weren't nearly as smart wow. as we thought we were. We had to swim 300 minutes um, at, at, uh, during that week, and I've never been so tired, so tired in my whole life. Where did you live? You, you said McCorder Hall. I lived at Werder Hall, Hall. Uh, the first year, and then I had a serious automobile accident and um, had to miss spring semester. That's why I had to go an extra, I keep saying semesters, they're quarters. I had to go an extra quarter to graduate. So I lived in uh, Reed Hall, right behind the stadium the second year. And then the third year, I did that thing where everybody convinces their parents, oh, it's much cheaper to let me live in an apartment because I'll cook for myself and this and that and the other. So I lived out at Callaway Gardens apartment my third year and then moved back to campus to Oglethorpe House, which was brand new, a co-ed dorm my fourth year. So we thought that was gonna be really something. My roommate Jimmy Hutchins and I living in a co-ed dorm. We may as well have been living in a monastery for all the good it did us. But uh, those were the four places I lived uh, the years how, I was here. How'd you get around? walked, rode the bus, rode with my friends. Most of my friends had cars and uh, it wasn't, it really wasn't hard. Yeah. All right, Darrell, you started in 71, right? The fall of fall 70. Of mm -hmm. Fall of 70. All right, talk about outside the college walls. What was going on in the world at the time and did what did it affect you? Did what was happening outside affect you or was Do you know, I'm ashamed to say because now I've taught history for the last 25 years and I'm so interested in everything that goes on in the world, but I didn't have a clue what was going on in the world. We were in Vietnam, of course, and I'd known some of my friends had been drafted and gone to Vietnam. Uh, I didn't have a clue what any of that was about. I thought I was a hawk. I thought, well, if the government's fighting a the war, then they have a good reason to be fighting a war. Of course, the Everything got to, to, to the south a few years later after it got to the rest of the country. So during the time there, there, there came to be a point where the hippie movement um, came in. And of course, there were no real hippies here because if you're really a hippie, you wouldn't be in school. You'd be out hanging out at a commune somewhere. But the hippie wannabes, the hippie, hippie look-alike, that kind of thing came. So, you know, I was pretty conservative. I didn't... Uh, my friends and I thought we didn't like the people with long hair and the hippie wannabes, and we thought we were in favor of the war. It didn't really affect us much, though. We'd go up to Atlanta every now and then and hang out on 10th to 14th Street and uh, see those thousands of people that were standing there reading The Great Speckled Bird and that kind of stuff. Uh, I do know that the first, <laughs> first uh, quarter I was here, I was looking at some of the signs at Memorial Hall and they had an SDS meeting, uh, Students for Democratic Society, and I said, well, I'm a Democrat. I thought everybody in Georgia was, so I think I'll go to that meeting. And it was in a farmhouse outside of town. It wasn't in a school uh, hall. And so I got my buddy and we went and uh, they were plotting to set fire to the ROTC building. We, I don't know what we'd gotten into. Um, so I didn't go tell anybody because I, uh, I thought that was just strange. But I really was clueless about you the outside. You really world. were. <laughs> I mean, I was. It, but I learned. I learned. I remember, um, you know, my biggest political statement was uh, to march in opposition to the Dixie Redcoat Band changing their name. That was, <laughs> that was as far as my politics went in those days. I hear you. Student life. Talk a little bit about what you did out, outside of class, what campus politics were like. Do you know any of those? You know, we, uh, we played a lot of gin rummy. <laughs> My buddies and I played a lot of gin rummy. We didn't date a lot. Uh, occasionally I would go on dates. I was very, very conservative, as I said, and I remember in those days there was no uh, dr I didn't drink at all the whole time I was at Georgia, and there was a lot of pressure to drink. That's what most people did, and I remember in those days there was no alcohol sales on Sunday. So I would, if I was ever going to ask anybody out on the first date, I'd always ask them out on a Sunday to take the pressure away of whether I was going to offer to buy them a drink or whether we were going to have drinks. Um, the the biggest bar, uh, our favorite 
place to go and I would go with my buddies and um, I was a designated driver before it was cool because they'd always get me to drive the car because they knew I was going to be drinking Coca-Colas but we go out to the fifth quarter uh, and play foosball that was a big big deal and and uh, I remember uh, the Swinford brothers on the fifth quarter and then Craig Hertwig bought it. Craig Hertwig was my next door neighbor growing up and he was on the football team so Craig and I would hang out together and I'd hang out with a lot of football players six, eight. Uh, and big big every bit of six eight I remember when we were freshmen the army uh, recruiters came to talk to everybody in McWhorter Hall about the draft and that sort of thing because everybody in those days was worried about being drafted they were losing they were taking away the college deferments and so Craig stood up and uh, he thought that if you were 6'8", you couldn't be drafted. And uh, he stood up and asked, what if you're, he, kn he knew the number of inches, I can't do the math quick enough, but he said, what, what's 6'8", um, 72? He said, what if you're 82 inches tall? And the Army said, you'd make a hell of a soldier. <laughs> so, so you better not flunk out. And Craig was just deflated, he, he sat down, but, uh, you know, I wasn't involved in any campus activities uh, other than my classes and the, and the things that we did at the, at the PE uh, department. Uh, intramurals. Was, oh yeah, we played intramurals. We played badminton, basketball, touch football, did all the intramural. That was kind of a big deal sometimes. Yeah, it, it was. In fact, I was on a couple of championship basketball teams because I was a very good basketball player even though I was only a manager. Uh, in high school and college. It was funny, when I was managing the basketball team at Georgia, they would, um, we would have free throw shooting contests before every game, and the winner got extra tickets to sell. And uh, so for the first three or four times, I won the uh, tickets every time. And so then they made a rule, Barry Cohen made a rule that I couldn't, managers couldn't be in the free throw shooting contest anymore. So, I mean, I stayed busy and always had plenty to do. Well, if you were managing, you did. Um, football, Daryl, from every column practically, not every column, but many of your columns, obviously you're a, a rabid dog fan. Yes, I yeah, still am. And uh, it's, it's what my kids and I do together now. We, uh, we tailgate. I'm a member of the Oak Tree Tailgate Gang, and we've been in the same place over behind the vet school uh, for the last 30 years. We have a table that Coach Dooley put there that's got our name on it. This table belongs to the Oak Tree Tailgate Gang. And my kids always tailgated with us, but as they grew up and came into college, uh, i never forget the Jackson's first Saturday over here. We looked up, and he was coming across campus, and 30 kids were following him because all the heritage kids that went to Georgia didn't know what to do on game day, so they went to Jackson's room because they knew he was a veteran tailgater. He didn't know how to get rid of them, so they just followed him to our tailgate. Ate all we, your chicken. We managed to feed all 30 of them that day. But as the kids got older and older now, they have a separate tailgate uh, right next to ours, so that's a lot of fun. We still have our 30 or 40 old people, and they have 50 or 60 young people. Then Jackson's best friend, Jeremy Daly, um, is in law school now, so he's got a law school tailgate. And some of my older students that used to come to my tailgate when they were in college have their own. So now over there, we fill up that whole park. We have four different tailgate groups every Saturday with 220 people, and they all uh, sprang from coming to see me at the Oak Tree Tailgate Gang. So. So that's a lot of fun. When I was in college, I would go to uh, as many of the road games as I could. I was going to ask, did you ever, did we, you? Oh yeah, we, my buddies and I would, uh, would get in somebody's car and take off on a Friday and, and go to the game, scrounge for tickets. Um, but uh, we, we had a lot of fun on the road. Sleep in the car, find a place to stay, go. Yeah, we would, uh, you know, we would actually, we'd just go around knocking on doors in dormitories till we found somebody that didn't was, know what they were doing would and let, let us, you in? Let us sleep with them and in their rooms. And a lot of us knew people at this college or that college at Auburn. We all had friends that went to Auburn or Alabama. So yeah, it didn't require much money at all. Just a little gas and... A little bit of gas and uh, we, could, we, could beg we could beg food off 
tailgaters. And uh, so, yeah, it was fun. My first book, uh, Need Two, is actually about a um, couple of Georgia seniors who have no money, no car, no tickets. But four days before the Sugar Bowl in 1981, decided they couldn't live if they weren't there to see Herschel and the rest of the team play against Notre Dame for the national championship after the 1980 season. Tells who they blackmailed to get a car, who they lied to to get money, all the trouble they get into and out of along the way. And it ain't about me or my college roommate who's standing beside me on the cover of the book. But, but it's a funny story. And, you know, everybody asks me how much of this is you and, and blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff is rooted in truth. It all happened not necessarily to me or my friends, but stories I told, and, and I just put it all together in, in kind of a conglomeration. And uh, it's still my best-selling book every year. Every year we sell more copies of Need to than, than the other books. Uh, except this past year, I wrote a book, Yea Though I Walk, about my battle with cancer that became the number one bestseller on Amazon in April nationally in the inspirational category. So other than that, uh, Need 2 is still the favorite. And then you got a Need 4 too, don't need you? Need 4. Had to find out what happened to those guys. I, I want to see if they turned out okay. So I wrote a book uh, after the 2002 season about the trip to that Sugar Bowl game just so I could find out how they turned out. And they, they did good. One of them made a preacher. <laughs> uh, did you have a favorite or influential faculty person? Oh, you know, I had I had a lot of favorites. Earl Fells and Mike Castronis were, were, were you know, Special. Coach Fells taught everything. Uh, I remember he, he taught us basketball, square dancing, football, you name it, and Coach Fells would teach it, driver's education. And um, one day we, we called, the, I was, um, called Stegman Hall one night to find out something. Coach Fells answered the phone. He was taking over for the switchboard operator. Did it all. And he, yeah, I said, is this Coach Fells? Yeah. He's, and uh, I remember he, he, I was telling him one day after the mayoral race, I said, Coach Fells, I read in the paper that you got a vote for mayor of Athens. And he said, yeah, Huck, and if I could have voted twice, I'd have got two votes. <laughs> but he was special. Coach Mike was special. And I always had an interest in history even though I wasn't too much up on current events. And so I had a teacher named James Cobb, who was at that time a graduate assistant. And I just loved his survey class so much that I took three or four more classes from him. And uh, it's kind of funny, when my daughter, Jamie Lee, first came to Georgia, I was looking through the bulletin to see if any of my teachers were still there. And there was his name. He taught honors history. And she was in the honors program. All my kids were in the honors program. I wasn't, but they were. So I said, Jamie, this guy is great. He's so funny. You need to take his class. She said, I don't need history. I got a five on the AP exam. My history's taken care of. She, I said, well, take it as an elect. If he's great, you'll love him. And so um, she looked up his grades. And she said, Daddy, nobody in the whole class got an A in this course last semester. And I said, well, take it. So she took it anyway. I pressured her, and after about three weeks, she called me, and she said, what have you done? I said, what do you mean? She said, this, is, this guy is ancient. He just sits there and reads his notes over his glasses. He's the most boring thing I've ever heard and hard. But uh, as time went on, she started, he started rubbing off on her, and she really enjoyed it. And she got the only A that class. So my other two kids decided they had to have him too. And when Jenna got there, Jenna was taking his class uh, her first year. And about October, Dr. Cobb sent me an email and said, well, Mr. Huckabee, I finally taught the, the Huckabee child most like her father. And I knew that wasn't good. So I, I made a trip to Athens and sat down with Jen and we had a come to Jesus meeting about her academics because I knew what that meant and uh, she was like me. She wasn't finding enough time to study and, and, be, and concentrate enough so we got that turned around. But I still love Dr. Cobb. We, we, we communicate a lot. He, he's one of the best. He's a, he's a favorite on campus. How about campus characters? I know, you know, over the years and you know, there, was, um, there were people you'd always see. Uh, 
I remember there was one guy, there weren't many African Americans, you understand, at Georgia back in the early 70s, and there was this one kid that everybody always saw, he was about 6'5", he had a great big afro, and he wore a Macon whoopee shirt everywhere he went, and that was a, that was a minor league hockey team. And this guy was probably the most popular person on campus because everybody hollered at him and spoke to him and talked to him on the bus everywhere he went. And I remember, uh, I got to know him pretty good and he was a film major. And that spring of my, my freshman year, it had been 1971, they were, he was having to make a, a 45 second film for uh, his, one of his film classes. And he told me to come out and watch him shoot it. And he told me he was gonna be on the Reed the bank outside Reed Hall at a certain time on a certain day. And you know what it's like in the springtime. All the girls are in their bikinis out sunbathing. So, so we came over there to watch this film being made, my buddies and I, and the, the guy with the camera zoomed in on all the nubile bodies out there and rubbing themselves with copper tone and stretched out and they did all this for a while. Then they focused on the door outside Reed Hall and my, my buddy came out in his making whoopee shirt and he's got jams on, his making whoopee shirt, his afro's out, he's got a towel over his shoulder and a big jug of Clorox. And he lays down and starts dabbing Clorox <laughs> on his arm and then it's fade to black. So he was kind of a character. Uh, I had the biggest crush on Coach Mike's daughter. Mary uh, or Helen? Helen, we, you know, he called himself Black Mike, Black Mike Castronis, All-American Tackle, 1944. He didn't tell us everybody else was in World War II, but, uh, but Helen was just beautiful. And I never had the nerve to speak to, we called her Black Helen behind her back because of Black Mike. And I had the biggest crush on her forever. They I had just, that swarthy Greek. Oh, they, they did, oh yeah, she's, uh, and I, uh, I've gotten to be good friends with Mary uh, over the years and uh, I confessed to her that uh, I had a huge crush on Helen and she was real jealous because I didn't have a crush on her because she said I was there too but um, and Pat Swindle was the student body president one of the years that uh, I guess my my senior year and uh, we never knew that he would go so far I interesting uh, downward yes, interesting in the political trip. spiral yeah Jimmy Wood was a football player, a lineman, one of the biggest human beings I've ever known. Lived in McWhorter Hall, and you know, those rooms all had doors to the outside, like a Holiday Inn or something. And Wood would go to bed early, like nine o'clock, he would go to bed. One night, he was already tucked in with the door locked in his room, and we were messing around outside McWhorter Hall, and we found a possum and caught it in a bag, and somebody, it might have been me, suggested that we take that possum and uh, throw it in Wood's room. So we got Coach Casey, who was the dorm dad that lived at the dorm, to open up Wood's room. And we threw that possum in there and locked the door back. And it woke him up. It was snarling. It was mad because it had been in that bag the whole time. And next next thing we heard was, was, was Wood screaming and hollering. He was scared to death. He was jumping up and down on his bed. He broke the bed, his big old body jumping up. And uh, he came out and he swore that he would kill anybody if he ever found out who had done it. So nobody told him. We, we were all, nobody knew anything about it. Well, about five years ago, I was at the football game with my son Jackson and uh, Jimmy Wood, lo and behold, I hadn't seen him in 35 years, came and sat down right in front of us. And I told Jackson that story over and over and over. And I leaned over and I said, Jackson, you remember the story about the football player and the possum? And he said, yeah. I said, that's him. I said, I think I'm going to tell him it was me that did it. And I tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around. And he was so glad to see me. And of course, he recognized me right away. And we talked and I said, Jimmy, you remember the time somebody put that possum in your bedroom? at McWhorter Hall, and he bowed up and said, yeah, if I ever find out who did that, I'll kill him. So uh, so until this day, he doesn't know. No, I didn't say anything about the possum, so I hope he doesn't ever get a hold of this tape. I might be in trouble. But I guess the highlight of my four-year career had to be Streak Week, though. Uh, that was just the most amazing thing that had ever happened. 
remember my buddy and I were living in, in Oglethorpe House and we decided we were going to go to dinner. Uh, we're going to go out and eat supper uh, instead of eating the food that we'd already purchased in the cafeteria. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And we walked out the side of Oglethorpe House and there was a huge crowd of people gathered up on, by the high-rise dorms up on um, Baxter Street. And so Jimmy screamed out, I bet there's a race riot because there had been a lot of marches and demonstration about the red coat ban and this and that and the other. So we went flying up there to see what was going and the people were lined up in front of Lums there and they were just waiting. And I said, what's going on? I said, people are streaking. You know, that it had caught on all over the country. Ray Stevens had come out with that song. So we waited and waited and waited and finally uh, the door from um, Russell Hall opened uh, at the basement and a girl with a bag over her head ran out of the door across the lawn and into the door that was opened at uh, Cresswell and uh, Buck stark naked I'm Buck guessing. stark naked and that that was the beginning of it and then we, we stayed there that that day and then more and more people started doing it and that night uh, it tur day turned to night and everybody was still out there and thousands and thousands of people had gathered and we just cut off Baxter Street and uh, the Athens police came in and the people parted enough to let the cars come in but then they got back in front of them. Uh, Pat Swindle was student body president and he came out with a, with a microphone, a bullhorn and was talking to everybody, told everybody to sit down, that he was not going to negotiate with the, with the police and they were going to leave the campus and while we were sitting there waiting for Swindle to tell us what he was going to tell us, a policeman threw a tear gas canister right into the crowd and just all hell broke out. And uh, the people went crazy. They started rocking the police cars, then they ripped the lights off of it, then they started turning the police cars over. And it got really, really, really ugly. And nobody would leave. I mean, they probably tore up three police cars that night. So the, the president of the university and the chief of police of Athens got together and they agreed that the Athens police would stay off the campus uh, and that nobody would enforce anything against streakers. And so the rest of that week, it was just crazy. It was like Mardi Gras. Everybody, every night was just riding around in their cars. It was like an all night party every night. It just had, it was in March, first of March. It just so happened that there was, it was 80 degrees every day. And it was just, it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. People would, you, the bus would stop. Somebody would be standing there in a raincoat and they'd throw the raincoat coat down and get on the bus, go up, get out the back door and run away. People would run through classrooms. Uh, and then I guess the culmination, Wednesday at, was Thursday afternoon. Somebody decided that we were gonna set the record, the world record for the biggest streak. Jimmy the Greek Snyder did a football prediction show uh, or just a sports talk show uh, on CBS at that time. And he set odds that the University of Georgia would break the national record for most streakers before the end of the week. And that just set everybody off. So they said after the basketball game on Thursday night, everybody was gonna meet at the Myers Quadrangle and uh, go together. And so that Thursday afternoon, it was crazy. We were riding around, we looked up over at the intramural field and there were parachuters coming down. And we said, surely not. And so everybody started flying in. Sure enough, five naked people parachuting on the intramural field. Uh, so we all gathered that night um, at the Myers Quadrangle just to see what was going to happen. There were thousands of people there, hundreds of people ready to streak, and thousands lining the street from Myers down to the stadium. And Lady Godiva was there. There was a girl on a horse with long blonde hair. and. At Oglethorpe, where I was living at the time, they always had these, these planned activities. We'd had a Halloween party, and there was a girl there dressed as Wonder Woman. I didn't know her name. My roommate and I fell in love with her, though. She was our fantasy for the rest of the year. And all of a sudden, Jimmy said, look, there's Wonder Woman. And she was standing there getting ready to streak. And all we could think was, we're going to get to see the fantasy girl naked. What a, and so 
they started counting down. We we're going to start at 11 o'clock. Everybody was chanting, wait until 11. Don't go. So at 11 o'clock, they counted down from 60 to zero uh, backward like the space launches, and everybody took off their clothes. Uh, and we, it wasn't, there was nothing sensual or erotic about it. It was like a meat market. There wasn't any streaking. There were too many people. We were plotting, but there were over 1,200 of us and uh, we marched through those thousands of people lying in the streets into Sanford Stadium. They had people stamping our hands and a certified accountant checking off everybody that came through the certain gate. Um, and we set the record, and everybody was given a little keychain that said World, streaking, World, World Champion Streaking Team, and then it was over. It just That was it, and nobody, uh, never seen anybody naked running around campus again since then. Just went away. but. Jimmy and I did it, and um, we, were, we, we thought we'd be anonymous because we put bags over our head. But I told you that I missed a whole semester of college because I had a, a serious surgery, and Jimmy has bright, bright red hair. So we were going along, and there were people there, and we looked over through our bags, and we saw some kids that we'd gone to high school with, and. One of them screamed out, look, there's Huckabee and Hutchins. I can tell by Hutchins' hair and Huckabee's stomach and the scars. And so we were. No, no we way were, to remain anonymous. So. We were found. That I years. actually was on the sidewalk watching that as an old pregnant married lady. <laughs> and had 80-year-old Aunt Martha with me. So. You know, it's funny. Every year, I've written about that a couple of times. And every year, when it gets to be the 1st of March, I have students call to interview me and, want to, and, and ask, ask about the the streaking and if it really happened and it did it really did there are two pages in the pandora to, to, it to really prove did. it and of course dean tate was uh was kind of the, the center of the campus community and uh dean tate would come when word would get around in the dorms that dean tate was in the lobby telling stories everybody would go and listen to dean tate and Dean Tate, you know, thought that Florida was the tropics and that Alabama was the far west. And he would always sit there and he would talk about these damn Yankees and damn Yankees and how it is up north and how it is up north. And uh, he thought Georgia was the center of the universe. And I asked him one night, I said, Dean Tate, you always talking about how bad things are up north and how it is up north. Have you ever even been up north? He got all bowed up. And did it. Chin says, son, I spent a whole weekend in Nashville one time. <laughs> so, he was special. Never be another one like him. Well, your college years, you completed a degree in education, and then you put it to use, didn't you? 39 years. I, I, I just retired uh, in May after 39 years in the classroom, and I didn't want to retire then, but... Uh, I've been suffering, uh, struggling with some health problems, and physically I just wasn't able to do the job the way it needed to be done. I could, I'd be okay for about 45 minutes a day, and then I would just be done. Worn out. Uh, so I have uh, had to step down, but. Uh, you taught history and coached basketball, is that right? Or? Coached basketball and football and a few other sports. Same place sports the whole well. time? No, I moved around when you, you know, when you're, a young basketball coach you, or football coach, you keep moving, trying to get a better job or a promotion. So I started out teaching back in Newton County, where I was from. Then I went to a private school in South Georgia for a couple of years because I had an opportunity to get a head coaching job there. Then I came back to DeKalb County, Clarkston High School, and um, coached at Woodward Academy in College Park for seven years. Then went to Loganville, and the last 15 years I taught in Rockdale County at Heritage High School. I tell you, working with young people, though, is a pretty good life. It is. You know, my son was in the uh, Department of Landscape Architecture when he first came here. I have a, my cousin Carolyn, that I told you about, was one of the reasons I knew I was going to go to Georgia. I had a son, Howell, who graduated from LAR was living a good life designing golf courses down at West Palm Beach and was tragically killed mm -hmm. in a car crash on his 27th birthday. So Carolyn gives a scholarship to uh, the LAR school every year. 
And one night my phone rang late at night and I picked it up and it was Carolyn. And she said, you know, I was at the banquet tonight at the Landscape Architect School to give Howell a scholarship and they called out Jackson's name as the most outstanding student in the sophomore class. And he wasn't there to get his award and I just wondered why. I said, well, I had no idea. I didn't know anything about it, but I'll find out. So I called Jackson. I said, Jackson, Carolyn says that you're supposed to get an award tonight and you didn't even show up. That's, that's rude. Why did, why did you do that? He started crying. He said, well, I switched majors and I didn't want to come get their um, award knowing that I wasn't going to be in their school next year. I just didn't feel right about it. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me you switched majors? He said, I didn't want you to yell at me. I said, why would I yell at you for switching majors? What did you switch to? He said, education. So I yelled at him. I said, are you crazy? You know what it's like in education now? And uh, I asked him why he did that. And he said, well, I wasn't happy in landscape architecture. All they talked about was how much money I was going to make. And I'm not really interested in money. It's easy not to be interested in money when your daddy pays all your bills. But uh, so I went to the career center and talked to the counselors and they told me to list the happiest people I knew and then to make a list of the people I respected the most in my life. And he said the list was the same and it was all my teachers. He said Mr. Gajalnik, uh, who was his band director, Mr. Tramontano, who taught him stats. He said all of my teachers are the people that seem happiest and they're the people that I respect the most and everywhere you go, all my life, everywhere I've been with you, people come up to you and say, do you remember me? You were my teacher here, you were my and they have so much respect for you, and uh, that's the kind of life I want to have. So uh, what could I say? I couldn't yell at any more about that. That's so, a wise children. Too. But I prayed every night for the next two years that he would actually wind up in a school where he could teach because so many instances that's not the case. But He's at North Oconee High School, a great school, has a great principal, and uh, he's a super teacher, so I'm very, very proud that he made that decision. You taught history? Yeah. Or just whatever they told you to teach? Well, uh, when I got to the point where I got my master's in history, because that's what I wanted to teach, early on I taught some of everything. I taught. Uh, life science and because a lot of coaches they figure you've taken a lot of science you could teach bio I taught biology even taught algebra one year taught English but social studies and history were my favorite subject I'll never forget though I, my first teaching job was at Cousins Middle School right out of Georgia I was determined I was going to be the best teacher that ever was I was going to teach my students everything I knew and I did it took me about three weeks <laughs> and then we had 33 weeks of school left, so I didn't know what to do. I was teaching life science to seventh graders, so I started reading to them out of the book, and we were doing a section on public safety and personal safety and health, and I read out of the book, and that's when I learned that when you're teaching, what you say and what the students hear aren't necessarily the same thing. I was reading out of a book, uh, and I read this sentence, in New York City alone, a person gets hit by a car every 15 minutes. A little boy in the back of the room, Wallace Roseberry raised his hand. Wallace was about four feet high. He had an afro four feet wide. This was 1974. Wallace raised his hand and said, Coach Huckabee. I said, what Wallace? He said, somebody ought to tell that fool to stay on the sidewalk. <laughs> so uh, I learned that what I was teaching, what they were hearing, weren't necessarily the same thing. Coaching, talk a little bit about coaching. Was that the real, love of your life more to begin than with it was to begin with I I actually I honestly admit that I taught and to be able to coach but as the years went on I became to particularly after I had children I realized that while coaching is important uh, and and I think athletics are important uh, I became much much more academically inclined and so Eventually, when I started writing, I got out of coaching and, and um, began to concentrate on the classroom more and wound up teaching AP, Advanced Placement U.S. History, for about 15 years. And, uh, but I loved it all. I just loved the relationship with the, with the children. That's the, that's the main thing. If you can make a difference in a, in a child's life, it's not the subject matter. You know, with today's technology, you can 
take out your cell phone and find the answer to any question anybody has in 30 seconds. But it's trying to encourage those kids to want to know more, trying to motivate them to try to learn on their own, uh, trying to teach them to think critically, uh, to make a positive impact on the world around them. Uh, those are the things that I enjoyed about teaching. And um, I would say that I had a very successful career and I'm glad that I did it. Look back and be content with where, you, where you've been. I really am. I'm, um, and I'm not just sitting around waiting to die. I am uh, started a new business at the age of 61. I started a historic tour company and I take groups of people on tours all over the world. We went to, um, 50 people went to Boston in May with me and we refought the American Revolution. We won again. Uh, took a bunch of baseball fans on a bucket trip uh, tour in June. We went to Wrigley, uh, to Fenway Park, Yankee Stadium, Cooperstown, the Hall of Fame. Just got back last weekend from uh, taking 50 people on an eight-day tour of the battlefields of the War of Northern Aggression and uh, had a great, great time. Coach Rick's dad went with us. Um, we've got trips coming up to Philadelphia and Lancaster, Pennsylvania next month, taking 80 people to New York City uh, for Christmas in um, December. And we've got trips to uh, the Holy Land and a World War II tour of Europe and, and a trip to the Western National Parks and a trip to Alaska coming up in August. So I'm going to stay busy. busy. I'm determined I'd rather wear out than rust out. I hear you. Do a lot of speaking. I've I've, uh, I think I have six speaking engagements in Athens this week, so uh, I'm staying busy. Go back and tell me how your writing career got started. You know, I always wanted to be a writer. I mean, when I was in high school, I was the editor of the school paper. I've been writing for the local paper, and that's what I wanted to be until I decided I just really wanted to teach and coach. So I put writing on the back burner and I said, you know, the plan was that I will teach 30 years, I'll retire, my wife and I will move to Pauley's Island, South Carolina, and I'll start as a career as a writer. But it, God just kind of got it all out of whack from my plans. Louis Gazard had died. I was a big fan of Louis and had become friends with him in the Georgia Bulldog uh, Club and thing, uh, different outings we'd been on. and. Lewis had died, and it was a cold February day, and I was complaining uh, about the fact that nobody had taken Lewis's place. And I said, you know, nobody writes anything funny in the paper anymore. Nobody takes up for the Southern anymore. And my lovely wife, Lisa, said, well, if you can do better than they're doing, you ought to do it yourself. So I thought, well, maybe I will. Lewis, the week before he died, had written his last column, and he listed a lot of things he wanted to do if he survived his surgery, which he didn't. They call that a bucket list these days. But one of the things that Lewis wanted to do was to write a novel just to prove that he could. He had written 20 books, but he wanted to write a novel. And he said in that column, I guess I'd have to write uh, about what I know the most about. And that's drinking beer, chasing women, and Georgia football. Well. I don't drink beer, and I'm not going to admit to chasing women, but I know a lot about Georgia football. So I sat down in front of the fire on a cold February Sunday afternoon and got a yellow legal pad and a ballpoint pen. I said, I'm going to write what I think Lewis's novel would be like. And I wrote a chapter and set it aside, and that was that. Well, that night I was getting ready for bed, and my lovely wife Lisa was in the bedroom dying laughing, which unusual, but I wasn't even in there yet. So I went in to see what she was laughing at, and she had my manuscript. And she said, this is funny. What's going to happen next? And I said, nothing's going to happen next. I was just missing Lewis, so I decided I'd write that just to get it out of my system. And uh, she started staying after me every day. You need to write some more of that book. You need to write some more of that book. So I started writing, and I got kind of into it, and I couldn't wait to get up each day and find out what was going to happen to those guys because I didn't realize you supposed to already know what was going to happen when you started writing the book. And I just made it up as I went along. And we got it uh, just about finished. And Lisa said, we've got to try to get this published. Uh, you know. And at first, 
the, the book was kind of risque by my standards because I was writing the way I think Lewis would write, and so we thought about publishing under assumed name because I didn't want anybody to know that I thought about those things. But then she said, well, this is going to be a good book. You need to have your name on it. And we, we made copies. We went to Kinko's and, and made copies and sent out six copies of the manuscript to six different publishers, never thinking that I'd hear back from any of them. And within 10 days, we'd gotten letters from all six offering to publish the, the book. So I may be from Porterdale and not very smart, but I let the person who offered me the most money publish it, and that was St. Simon's Press. Um, they published the book. It became a, a, a regional bestseller that year, and um, I guess the rest is kind of self-explanatory. But later I started writing a column for... Uh, our local newspaper and then other papers started asking if they could publish the column and so now I write three columns a week in 15 different newspapers and I've, I've published uh, 13 books uh, but I'm really not very well known outside the this local area and that's by my choice in a way because I've gotten a lot of offers from national publishing houses to publish my work and, and they even wanted me to do a reality TV show coming up this fall but you know that's not what I want to do every contract I got offered said you've got to be away this many nights from home and I wanted to teach I wanted to be around my kids I never wanted to go all over the country promoting books and begging people to buy my book and anything like that I've done it just basically for my own satisfaction and it's worked out well I'm very content uh, with my place in the literary world which happens to be within about 70 mile radius, I think, but that's okay. We sell a lot of books every year and a lot of people comment that they like my columns and uh, so it's, it's been good. Good I'm life. glad I finally got to do that. And speaking sort of naturally followed the writing, didn't it? It, it did and you know, um, I, I've always enjoyed speaking and for about 15 years I've been speaking to churches uh, I really had a call to preach that I just ignored until recently. So I did a lot of speaking at churches. I tell funny stories and, um, and finish with an inspirational message. And then when I started writing, more and more people started asking me to speak. So I have a very full speaking schedule. I speak to a lot of big national conventions and have gone all over the country doing that, strictly entertainment. But I've also gone back to... to school since I was sick and um, uh, become a licensed certified lay minister in the Methodist Church and so I'm preaching um, almost every Sunday at different places as well so I stay when do you have time really, to eat really busy Darryl? well I find time to eat as my wife would, would tell you but uh, I don't spend much time sitting around uh, I don't have much time left they tell me so I don't want to waste any of it okay. sitting around watching Every television. Minute. I Every wanna, minute out there, I'm telling you. I want to do it. It's true. You have written candidly about your battle with cancer. And I think that has been a, a, a true connector with so many people. I know you've probably been covered up with. Well, you know, when I first was diagnosed, when I first realized that the cancer had metastasized into my bones and it was serious, um, I hadn't written about it. I didn't tell many people about it. I was at a celebrity golf tournament out at the Georgia Club one Saturday. Even though I'm not a celebrity nor a golfer, they invite me every year. And this was right after I'd had some, some of my cancer surgeries. I wasn't able to play. I was riding in a golf cart uh, with my buddy, Buddy Neal, just talking to everybody. And he said, uh, you know, I heard you had cancer. And I said, well, yeah, it's pretty bad. He said, well, I haven't read anything about it in your column. I said, oh, no, it's not going to be in my column. That's a personal thing. I don't really talk about it. And I thought he would give me some kind of, um, you know, uh, feel sorry for me, give me some sympathy. And he looked at me and said, you sure are selfish. I said, selfish? What do you mean? He said, you're keeping all this to yourself. He said, number one, there are thousands of people who read your column every week and feel like they know you. They feel like you're a friend and they would want to pray for you. And you're keeping them from being able to do that. And number two, uh, you could write about this and you could be an inspiration for other people who are going through the same thing. 
uh, he said you have a you have an audience that not many people have and you you should be helping those people and he pointed to a boulder that was on the side of the um, golf course and he said if I asked you to move that boulder would you do it by yourself and I said no I'd get everybody I could to help me it's heavy he said well you're carrying a heavy load all by yourself and you need to get people to help you carry that load too. So what he said made a lot of sense and I went back that very weekend for the first time, wrote about my cancer and um, I just heard from so many, not hundreds of people, thousands of people all over the country that I had no idea even read my column. You know, the internet's quite amazing. And so since then I, I decided I would be very open with it and I've tried to you know, I don't want to spend all my time talking about poor, poor, pitiful me. I have terminal cancer, blah, blah, blah. But I do want people to know how I'm doing, and I'm doing great because I have confounded the, do the doctors, and uh, I just keep on keeping on. So uh, 18 months ago, the doctors in three states told me to go home and get my affairs in order, that there's nothing they could do. But I'm still here 18 months later. So You look great. Thank you. Well, I said that we would talk about some wide-ranging topics in the list of topics that you didn't get, Daryl. <laughs> and just, uh, is there anything that we've not touched on today that, that you might like? I'd like to go back and talk about Stegman Hall, how you felt about Stegman Hall coming down. And you know, I spent so much time in Stegman Hall, but, um, you know, it would be one thing if they tore it down and didn't replace it. But the Ramsey Center is so magnificent. It's hard to feel hard about, bad about losing that, that, that dingy old building because, um, I mean, even when I was there, that's what it was. And uh, it'll have fond memories, but it's not, it's not something that I think we needed to, they, they put the name Stegman on the Coliseum, and I think that was, a, a worthy thing but important thing. I had a lot of fun in Stegman Hall and uh, did a lot of work uh, a lot of uh, you know we had coach Mervos and weight training and Lee Cunningham and gymnastics and I've talked about coach Sholey and uh, coach Fails and coach Clements it'll have uh, it'll have a warm place in my heart for a long long time but I think I think they've done a marvelous job with this campus yeah, that's amazing. Uh, every every that's time I come, I'm just so, it, it really is amazing. The, the Coverdale building and the Middle Learning Center are, are just fantastic buildings, and they fit right in. The, they're so classy and so stylish. And uh, I just, uh, you know, my daughter recently got married, uh, and the, the wedding was at the UGA Chapel. And the reception was on Hurdy Field, which is the first athletic field. And the rehearsal dinner was in President Adams' box at Sanford Stadium, although it's not President Adams' box any longer. But uh, so she, I know I raised her right. Uh, we had a, <laughs> Dad we had a UGA. The and I was so, so um, happy that everybody who came to the wedding got to see the, the campus because I'm, I'm so proud of the University of Georgia, not just its athletic teams, but what it stands for uh, in the academic world as well. So, I think you're right. Do you all have anything that we haven't touched on that you think of? Daryl, if you think of something, you know, amazingly, my closing thought was going to be you've been compared with another of UGA's beloved sons, Southern humorist Louis Grizzard. You know, and how Lewis, do you feel about that? And well, that's exactly what you've already touched on. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about that, though. Lewis, um, you know, people are always saying, and some people are kind of disparaging, oh, you think you're Louis Grizzard, you're trying to be Louis Grizzard. Number one, I'm not. If you examine his writing and my writing, the style is completely different. Lewis's sentences were short and concise. It was his own style. My sentences, some of them have 35 words, so our styles are not the same. We write about some of the same things. Um, but I wouldn't trade places with Lewis um, for all the money in the world because Lewis was one of the most conflicted people I've ever known. 
Um, he had lots and lots of money. He had lots and lots of fame, and his stories will live forever. And I'm determined I'm going to try to help his stories uh, live forever because I love Lewis. Every day for 15 years, we live on a farm. Uh, our driveway is about 150 yards long. And every day for 15 years, I'd get up, turn on the coffee, walk up the driveway to get the paper. I'd open it up and read Lewis's column on my way back down the hill. And then I would pour myself a cup of coffee and I'd read Lewis's column again. It's been a long time since there's been anything in the Atlanta Constitution worth reading twice, I can tell you that. But Lewis had one of the saddest lives I've ever known. He was so conflicted. He wanted to do good so bad and he just couldn't. He said, I just feel like I'm home, I'm married, and there's a party going on somewhere and I'm not part of it. And toward the end of his life, um, he, he drank so much and he had a, a group of people that surrounded him that he thought were his friends and they were stealing his money and just living off his um, prominence. And uh, I'm not trying to be Louis Grizzard. I, uh, I'm just happy to be Daryl Huckabee. And if people compare my writing to Lewis, that's mighty high cotton. Uh, but, but I'm not trying to be him. Uh, there's only one Lewis. When he died uh, at such an early age, I called my friend Lester Maddox and I said, Governor, I'm just so sad today because Lewis is, is gone. And he said, oh, don't worry about it, school teacher. Lewis crammed more living in uh, his 43 years than most of us will cram into 80. So, so and, and he's, he's, pro he's probably, probably right. Well, we're glad that you're a Daryl Huckabee, and we're glad you're one of ours. Thank you. And thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate it. It's been fun. It's been an honor. It has been fun.